I'm Josh Hammer. I'm Anna Stepman. I'm Ben Weingarten. I'm Emily Jashinsky. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the, by the Emin Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Subscribe now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So welcome back. As always, everyone, we have a well-rounded show. We're going to kick it off with two judicial overreach or judiciary in general related segments. So Ben will start by talking about the Supreme Court's findings, or as the case may be, lack thereof, when it comes to the infamous leak from the Dobbs abortion opinion last May. I will then continue with kind of a broader theme segment on judicial supremacy versus democracy, focusing most directly on the current debate roiling Israel's politics, but this is a much broader and international theme that we're seeing playing out in a lot of different countries. Emily's then going to talk about the culture of mass shootings. We have horrifically seen some more mass shootings out of California in recent days. We'll get into that. And then Inez will take us home by talking about how millennials don't seem to be getting more conservative with age, unfortunate as the case may be. So, Ben, why don't you kick us off with an update on the Supreme Court and Dobbs? Thanks, Josh. So last week we got word from the Supreme Court that after eight months, there was no Dobbs leaker to be found, at least as of yet. And to me, I just state up front, this is an absolute disgrace. And the fact that no leaker has been found, well, one point I'd make up front also is, since it's been a recurring theme here, if you had America's national security, intelligence, law enforcement apparatus, as zealous in its pursuit of the Dobbs leaker as it is of, say, January 6th defendants, nonviolent January 6th defendants in some cases, do you think we wouldn't know who the leaker was today? I'm quite certain we would know who that leaker was. So this non-conclusive finding smacks of two horrible alternatives. One is total rank incompetence. The other is corruption or something more nefarious at play. Uh, to put it directly, did the court not want to know who actually leaked? And if you were working backwards from that kind of theory, what would you do differently than to put the marshal of the Supreme Court on this case instead of, say, the FBI, which is what the court did? And what would you do differently than as the marshal who was forced to respond to the criticism? And by the way, questions from people on the left and right, because the left has their conspiracy theorists who say this was you know, Roberts, or this was Alito who leaked it, from the left and right asking, well, you know, were the Supreme Court justices themselves interviewed? Did they have to sign sworn affidavits attesting to the fact that they were not the leakers? And Gail Curley, the marshal of the court, who's never done, as far as I know, an investigation like this before, and there's never really been an analogous investigation to this one, had to come out with a short terse statement subsequent to the release of the court's own non-finding document and said that they did speak to Supreme Court justices, but it's it essentially seemed to be an arm's length sort of, we asked them some questions, it was very cordial, we showed them the due deference that they're deserved, they didn't have to sign affidavits and such. We don't know, for example, if like some other employees, at least according to this report, the judge's electronic devices were collected and examined forensically. There's a whole slew of things we don't know about what the investigation entailed. We know that around 100 people, employees of the court, and it was vaguely put in the, the finding or non-finding, uh, were interviewed and or probed, some of them multiple times. Uh, we had known from past reporting that in some cases, electronic devices were seized. Um, all of these people denied, apparently, that they were the leaker, as one would expect. There were a couple of pathetic things that I saw in the long form version of what the investigation actually entailed. Uh, they said there was no evidence discovered that anyone emailed the draft opinion to anyone else, although technical limitations in the court's computer record keeping at the time made it impossible to rule out this possibility entirely. Utterly asinine. Another utterly asinine part of the report. And, and, and this is where it gets to you know, there's sort of an alibi here of, well, you know, we just didn't have the right systems in place, as opposed to how could it be that there would ever be an employee of a court that would engage in the kind of grave 
an unbelievable, unconscionable act that actually took place. It says, the pandemic and resulting expansion of the ability to work from home, as well as gaps in the court security policies, created an environment where it was too easy to remove sensitive information from the building and the court's IT networks, increasing the risk of both deliberate and accidental disclosures of court sensitive information. Uh, this record strikes me as a total whitewash, move along, nothing to see here. They got a former DHS secretary to rubber stamp and, and pledge to the fact that it appeared the marshal undertook a thorough and rigorous investigation. Worth noting that former DHS secretary himself has been on public record as indicating at the time of the Hunter Biden laptop story coming out that he believed it was Russian disinformation as well. So uh, what a what a rousing and, and stirring sort of endorser of the report that we have there. Uh, so I just think that this is ultimately the irony here, among other ironies, is that the Roberts Supreme Court under John Roberts has always claimed to be about protecting and preserving the institution. And I've argued at length in the past that John Roberts, by his own decisions, particularly in five to four type cases, uh, have undermined the court as an institution because they've oftentimes strayed from the actual principles that judges are supposed to adhere to. And we could talk about a lot of cases like that. Josh could probably go chapter and verse on it. But beyond that, this undermines the institution. It took eight months to get to a non-answer here. And the Supreme Court, as far as I can see, has been irrevocably damaged as a consequence of this because judges are never going to be able to deliberate in confidence again. There's going to be constant public pressure then and potentially fears of assaults on judges as a consequence of these decisions potentially leaking early. And when there's no accountability, it just guarantees worse injustices down the road. So John Roberts has gotten the worst of both worlds in that you've got leftists who want to expand the Supreme Court and claim the Supreme Court illegitimate when, quote unquote, conservative justices come to rulings they don't like and they want to do all manner of things to damage and undermine the court. And now, rightly, of course, in my view, you have conservatives who say, what the hell is the court doing when it can't or won't find out who leaked and bring that person to justice publicly for all to see? I think it's a supreme disgrace. There's no other way to put it. And with that, I put it out to the group for what your takes are on this non-conclusion. I mean, I think this is one of the biggest travesties of justice that we've seen over the past five, 10 years. I, I, I legitimately do not think that that is overstating the point here. The Supreme Court simply cannot function in a world in which internal employees, whether it's clerks, whether it's the justices themselves, whether it's the janitors, the spouses, the nieces, the nephews, whoever, the court by definition, definitionally cannot function if their internal deliberations are at risk of being leaked to the public. So therefore, ipso facto, I mean, a, a leak like this to go unpunished, an investigation to allegedly not find the ultimate source is nothing less than an existential risk to the Supreme Court as an institution. And, you know, I think back to, you know, some of those like sweeping statements from American history. So in 1937, when FDR famously tried to pack the Supreme Court to kind of get his New Deal legislation passed, the Senate Judiciary Committee emphatically rejected that, the Democratic-led Senate Judiciary Committee. And they had this just incredible statement about how, like, today we stand in history for an independent court, you know, a court that will not be cowed into intimidation. I, th I think back to all of those, you know, men and, like who throughout American history have stood for the integrity of an independent court, no matter how powerful or powerless it may be. We'll get to that in the next segment. But this is this is just appalling, appalling stuff. I mean, 37 law clerks plus nine justices gets you to 46 total people, throw in some spouses. This is not a large sample size. This is not a large sample size here. And I do not think it is particularly conspiratorial to say at this point, you know, given the fact that the justices themselves, we know for a fact, did not submit to the same level of scrutiny in the clerk's investigation as the clerks. They did not sign affidavits. I do not think it's particularly conspiratorial to say that the odds that this came from a justice, him or herself, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Sonia Sotomayor looking at you. I think the odds of that now are higher than they ever have been. Uh, and that's just disgraceful. It, it is nothing less than disgraceful. That's the only way that I can bring myself to believe these findings, because as Ben pointed out, the United States Intelligence Services should be able to get to the bottom of a case like this. You have 37 some suspects um, and the the full capacity that they have. I mean, it just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever that they wouldn't be able to figure out who did this. Other people would have suspicions. It just it, it's it defies 
reason. Um, and so the only way that I can kind of bring myself to understand how it, it may have just they, they they have not turned up a clerk is that it was justice um, because that's the only thing I can conceive of in, in the course of an investigation where uh, if, if they're not, you know, sort of treating justices with due suspicion or the same level of suspicion that they're treating clerks, maybe for some good reason, um, that's all that I can come up with. Uh, but it's, it's incredible. We don't know yet uh, exactly how badly this is going to injure the court's ability to function in our sort of ecosystem. It's a necessary part of that and it needs to be able to deliberate um, in, in in ways that this will absolutely harm. We don't know the extent of that yet, but it is incomprehensible just to echo what Josh and Ben have said that we cannot in 2023 figure out who did this. Um, maybe it reflects a lack of interest in figuring out who did it, um, or maybe it just reflects a lack of incompetence, or maybe it's corruption. Um, and this was a justice, one, one of the justices themselves. Yeah, I mean, I agree that it's good. The court is just going to have to change how it functions. I think that was probably inevitable. The kind of cordiality that existed, um, not just on the Supreme Court, famously on the Supreme Court, but in, in the entire sort of institution of the rule of law, uh, the kind of professional rules that we're used to, the, the engagement rules that we're used to within the legal profession, all of that is fading. Um, the court is just sort of the last bit of that to go. Um, I don't think that it's realistic to expect that that kind of cordiality and that kind of um, open exchange and, and ability to debate ideas within the parameters of the rule of law can actually survive contact with an ideology that is now uh, dominant in nearly all of the law schools from which these justices are drawing clerks. So whether it was the justices themselves um, or whether it was a clerk, uh, I, I mean, I agree with with all of you about, um, you know, the the this investigation having certain parameters and it, it shouldn't be that difficult to figure out who this was. Um, so I agree with, with what Ben said and was echoed by Josh and Emily about uh, the skepticism, either this is a, a justice or, um, you know, we. I don't really believe the incompetence thing because anybody of minimal competence, like you have access to everything. Um, you, you have a limited number of suspects, like uh, incompetence doesn't seem to, to be an obvious fit here. So it's a sign that they didn't want to find the person or the person as one of these justices who didn't have to sign an affidavit. Um, so, I mean, I, I just, I, it's, it's sad to see this happen. At the same time, I do think it's kind of inevitable. Uh, all of our institutions have been transformed by this ideology. The Supreme Court is, is no exception. It's just, it's finally reached the, the most insular halls of one of the most insular institutions in our in our system. All right, so let's transition to a related topic, which is kind of a broader segment on judicial supremacy versus democracy, focusing on the current kerfuffle that is happening in Israel. Um, there were there were 100,000 people that took to the streets of Tel Aviv just this past weekend to protest the government's proposed judicial reform package, which I wrote my last column in favor of. So I guess it's worth first getting into kind of the details of what that package does, and then we can kind of extrapolate and extend it to what is happening really kind of all throughout the world, where we see kind of right of center governments that are that are seeing their governmental plans kind of jammed up and blocked by left leaning judiciaries. So Israel does uh, Israel's system of governance, we should start there, I think most closely resembles kind of the British model. There was an unwritten constitution, there was a separation of powers, but there was a parliament and there implicitly was or, or, or should be a system of parliamentary supremacy, which is a very well established norm in Britain has been for centuries now, you know, I, I, we are well past Magna Carta. That is kind of the British style it, it is a common law based legal system, there is a court, but there is parliamentary supremacy where the where the people's sovereignty is ultimately vested in a legislature that that even more so than the American model is the political model that the still relatively young state of Israel has always tried to abide by. And to this day, they don't have a formally written constitution. What happened in Israel was in the 1990s, a leftist chief justice by the name of Aaron Barak pronounced a quote unquote constitutional revolution where he arrogated to the Israeli Supreme Court powers that from my kind of survey of, of Western style democracies seems to be basically unprecedented. So the way it has existed in Israel for the past 25, 30 years, is the Supreme Court can nullify legislation at any time for any reason whatsoever, literally because they deem it, quote unquote, extremely unreasonable or too political. They can even overturn 
the democratically elected governing coalition's appointments to cabinet level positions. That happened literally just last week, actually. <laughs> the Supreme Court um, nullified Prime Minister Netanyahu's choice of uh, a minister for the interior, minister of health. He, he's uh, named Arya Derry. And uh, I guess my basic take, which is the take, um, if you believe the polling of the majority of, of Israel's population, is that this is utterly in sync, <laughs> especially considering the fact that the court is largely kind of secular, liberal, left-leaning. Israel is kind of an, an increasingly kind of center-right, more traditional society. So there's just, there's just this huge, huge clash, and the low polling reflects that. So the, the, the current government, which, you know, as the mainstream media has reported and misreported wildly, um, is definitely a, a, a right of center coalition, has campaigned on judicial reforms. What are the two main planks of their judicial reform package? Well, one is to implement a so-called override clause. Canada, um, you know, our not particularly conservative neighbor to the north has an override clause. Um, operating in their system, which would basically permit the, the parliament the legislature by some threshold to override the decision of the Supreme Court. I add, by the way, that that proposal has been floated in the United States by various politicians for years. I remember, I remember distinctly when Newt Gingrich was running for the Republican nomination for president in 2012, he actually ran on a, on a, on a partial platform of adding a constitutional amendment to permit Congress to override the Supreme Court by a two-thirds majority. So that is the allegedly controversial first plank of the, of the judicial reform package, which again exists in a country purportedly founded upon parliamentary supremacy in accordance with the British model of governance. The second allegedly controversial plank would permit the uh, the parliaments, the elected officials there, to to have a much broader say in who the new justices to the Supreme Court were. So obviously in America, we have advice and consent where the president nominates and the Senate ratifies judicial nominees for the lower courts and the Supreme Court. Over there, the way it's been is the, is the justices effectively select their own replacements. So it's just a galling and extreme situation. My quick and dirty take is that if the United States Supreme Court acted the way that Israel's Supreme Court acted, cities would burn. There would be people rioting in the streets right now. And, you know, this again, this is a broader theme that Israel is not the first country to kind of see this dynamic playing out over the past decade in, um, you know, in Poland and Hungary in particular. When it comes to Europe, we have seen very similar clashes between a right of center governing coalition and left lean judiciaries. Most recently, we have seen this exact same dynamic play out in Brazil. So there was a, a very tightly contested, I think would be a polite way of saying it, election between Jair Bolsonaro and Lula da Silva, the leftist, kind of the godfather of la modern Latin American leftism after Fidel Castro himself. Lula's back in power, thanks in no small part to an overreaching and overweening leftist Supreme Court that has been Bolson that was Bolsonaro's arch enemy. So this is a broader dynamic here. Um, and I, you know, I guess my basic take is that I think it is imperative, it is incumbent upon conservatives, upon NATCON, people who actually stand for national sovereignty, for popular sovereignty, to just push back here, there, and everywhere against judicial tyranny and judicial overreach. So, you know, on, on, on that, you know, fairly straightforward conclusion, I'm happy to kind of toss it out to you guys for your thoughts on this. Well, I think everyone one thing, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, First of all, I would commend everyone to check out a, a profile, an interesting profile in the New Yorker of all places on Jonathan Mitchell, who is cast as a uh, conservative lawyer who is combating judicial supremacy here and might win some friends among progressives, progressives who now loathe the Supreme Court. And so they want to arrogate power down from the Supreme Court and else to other uh, power centers. Um, you know, it's interesting, of course, uh, naturally, you have the the corporate legacy media that loads everything about the new Israeli government. And there are obvious parallels here between kind of the hatred of Trump slash MAGA and efforts to take down Bibi Netanyahu in Israel and what you see in America as well. Uh, this administration, of course, is infamously hostile towards uh, conservatives or right of center, as Josh termed it, um, politicians in Israel. I think it's obviously insane that you have a tyranny of the judiciary, but I think we see a similar dynamic here. Obviously at the Supreme Court, it's not to the same extent as in a place like Israel where the Supreme Court can essentially veto everything. Uh, but what we see is that power centers in hoc to progressivism will seek to usurp more and more power from anyone who gets in their way. So in Israel, that takes the form of the judiciary. In America, it's been the administrative state plus the judiciary. But in every case, it's the legislative branch 
either weak and ineffective by design or as a consequence of that usurpation. And by design, I mean, because politicians don't actually want to legislate, take tough positions on issues and have to deal with the voters, much easier to kick it to a Supreme Court in the US on basically any matter of consequence. Uh, so that's a huge dereliction of duty of the legislative branch. But then you also have these other power centers that want to accrue more power and use it towards their favored end. So I think this is in part a story of those who want power will do everything that they can to usurp more of it. And in some places, it may be vested in the judiciary and other places it may be in the administrative state. But all of it at the end of the day is a trend of leftists towards not being willing to represent people and grapple with what people actually want. They want to impose their views and they'll do it by hook or by crook. And that's a prevailing theme across the West and extending into a kind of the fount, the fount of the West in Israel. Um, I, I'd like to point out here, I guess uh, what I'm thinking about is the misuse of the term liberal democracy uh, and often misuse of even of the term de democratic, right? Um, sometimes to describe things that are actively anti-democratic, that the only way you can preserve liberal de democracy is to make sure that the people don't have a voice in any, uh, just about any, especially particularly cultural matters in, in the governance of their, their countries. Uh, look, in this country, we have, we have two um, forms of, of sort of anti-democratic check on, um, on our elections. And then of course our elections are split and federalized and blah, blah, blah. We have many of these kinds of balancing um, very wise balancing uh, systems in our government, but there is essentially two forms of anti-democratic power. One's legitimate, the judiciary, and the other one is illegitimate, which is the administrative state. Now, the judiciary power might be legitimate, but that doesn't mean it's very limited and has been used illegitimately now um, for, for many decades by the left, and that's a problem. And I mean, some conservatives would argue all the way back to <laughs> Marbury, but um, I'm not going to do that here. But um, you can still use a legitimate anti-democratic power, anti-democratic check legitimately. Um, really, all of these debates, and, and um, I think Josh rightly brought out that there, there's, there are these similar kinds of debates in Poland, Hungary, um, in Brazil. I, I, I am very grateful, especially in these times that it seems to be um, that, that we do have so many challenges uh, that are, are going running right to the foundations of our system. I am very grateful for the traditions that we have here. The fact that we have centuries of tradition of, of hammering out these kinds of instances of, of battles between uh, the powers of, of, the legit, um, of the legislature versus the executive versus um, the courts. We actually have answered a lot of these questions over the years. This was not an obvious thing. So we should be, again, um, very grateful that, that these, these systems actually, despite the incredible turmoil and that the corruption that is going to the heart, and we are talking about this every week, obviously, um, it won't be able to last forever. But there is this sort of um, draft in the American system whereby we've always done things a certain way. And it is an advantage of having the oldest functioning constitution, continuously functioning constitution. Um, but yeah, I, I really think about, for example, Poland here, that they never, they never really hammered out um, what the role of judiciary would be. They made a compromise, essentially, uh, before the fall of the wall. They had to accept certain like continuity um, within that institution from the previous regime, uh, communist regime. And so like now they have to have this very messy process of hammering it out. And it, it looks like Israel is gonna go through some something similar. But bottom line for me, uh, when you hear the word liberal democracy, it's usually preceded by our, and, and they do mean our. Um, usually the words liberal democracy are just a cover for a particular set of um, a particular set of political commitments that are often no older than 20 or 30 years. I, I, we're, we're on time in this segment, which is great because I don't really have much to add uh, just to underscore everyone, although I would say obviously we're, we just saw Davos happen last week and we're at risk of, of having concentration um, of power in the hands of technocrats who think they know better than everybody else. And we're going to start seeing that happen around the world. Um, and, and one of the reasons is actually what we'll transition to. Um, in this next segment, which is you know, the, the threat of violence is one of those things when people are afraid um, that, you know, these, these sorts of technocrats can really seize on to amass their power. In this case, we're talking about the incredible tragedy of two mass shootings uh, in very close proximity in California. I think it's actually technically three um, because one was in two different locations, but uh, the, the one in Monterey, um, we're talking about 
11 people who were shot and killed. Uh, that was originally at 10, and I believe someone passed away uh, just in the last 24 hours or so, adding uh, to the, the death toll, um, getting that all the way up to 11. Uh, the second set of shootings, seven people have passed away, oddly, um, and this is very strange, the, the suspects, one is in uh, his late 60s, another is in his early 70s. Uh, they are, but they, they both uh, shot mostly in, in the case of Half Moon Bay, the second shooting um, farm workers, uh, Asian farm workers. And in the other case, this was a dance studio um, that was celebrating Lunar New Year. Um, so we have Asian American perpetrators, Asian immigrants, um, and uh, targeting Asian immigrants, I should say. Just an incredible uh, tragedy in California playing out over the course of very little time. Um, this is, comes on the heels of a Wall Street Journal article that uh, was was brought to my attention by our producer here, who who says juvenile. The Wall Street Journal says juvenile crime surges reversing surges reversing long decline. That is on an uptick since 2020, which is another one of these trends we've seen reverse in ways that are unusual uh, for the recent decades. We, we have seen that since the pandemic and even before the pandemic, uh, some trends that had been going in a good direction, suddenly reversing uh, for a sustained period of time for the first time in a very long time and getting us back, uh, basically undoing progress that has been done. Now, these two things may not seem related because in one case, we're talking about two elderly suspects. There is really no motive known in either case, um, which is another very strange thing. It's strange enough that you have how much is the cliche used uh, that you you often see young um, angsty white men perpetrating uh, crimes like this mass shootings like this in this case we have uh, elderly asian americans asian immigrants um, and so there's no motive we don't know what happened but um there are different things happening in this country. We can't just obviously paint with the broadest of brush and say we're just getting more violent and dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we are, in, on some measures, reversing progress. Uh, what's, what is legitimate progress? And in some measures, we are going in the wrong direction. Juvenile violence is one of them. Um, and in another case, just the disruption of, of normal life, uh, we've been dealing with the cause of mass shooting, we've been dealing with the uh, incidences of mass shootings for a very long time in this country, um, and the media has been saying, you know, January has seen I think they're, they're saying 39, something like that, um, which is 39 mass shootings and something around 1,200 non-suicide gun deaths. Um, the way they calculate mass shootings is, is not in the way most people think of mass shootings. Uh, so that's that's not to say there are 30, 39 different Half Moon Bay situations. Um, that doesn't make the deaths any less tragic. Um, but what we I think should, <clears throat> what I think we should talk about here is whether there's really what we're seeing a fraying, a post-COVID fraying in the, the sort of social fabric. Um, obviously last year was Uvalde and other horrible, tragic cases. Um, there was a, a shooting in Iowa school, I believe this month as well. Uh, there's there's just, it something feels off. Um, and I think the juvenile violence numbers are a good indicator of that. You know, if, if, there, if you're seeing something really wrong with our children, um, to the extent that they're engaging in higher rates of, of violence. Um, and then, you know, you just see cases like the ones in California where we don't know what broader trend they might represent. We don't know what the motive is and it would be sort of foolish to speculate, but they just sort of shake um, your faith in the country you live in uh, and your faith in your sort of security and your ability to have a happy, healthy family and, and uh, play by the rules. And obviously you can never minimize, you, you can never fully eliminate all of the risk that comes with just being a human being. Um, but it, it something does feel off. I don't purport to have the statistics or the numbers on that, but let me turn it over to the group. It's pretty clear that, um, by the way, that at least as far as the way the media covers these shootings, right, if, if the shooter is white, um, the, the cause is white supremacy. Uh, if the shooter is black or Hispanic, the, 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 the cause du jour is gun control. It's about the gun. And if the shooter is Asian, uh, well, we don't really, that doesn't really quite fit into any of our, our pre-existing narratives. So these are going to fall out of the the news very quickly. And, and um, so there, there's a clear media playbook. Of course, Emily is right to point us to the underlying issue and not to the the um, sort of very predictable media playbook here. Um, the only thing I would I would have to add is 
that there is there is a real to, to stay on the media topic for just one moment there is a real copycat media sort of effect here um it almost seems to have replaced the serial killer fanaticism in the night in the 1990s right um where by through this kind of coverage we do uh sort of encourage copycats um and and because of our fixation on this issue we, we tend to encourage copycats that's not to say that we shouldn't you know memorialize the victims and report the news but i do think that the sensational way in which we report it um you know i, I think it does behoove uh and i i know josh um especially the day when he was with the Daily Wire and Daily Wire does this, I'm pretty sure Newsweek does this. Um, you know, th th there is a real benefit in not sensationalizing the news coverage and focusing the news coverage on the victims rather than the perpetrators, because I, I really do think um, for sure it'll do more than than gun control laws, which, by the way, of course, in California, <laughs> um, th these were perpetrated in a state with very, very tough gun control laws. Um, including about high capacity magazines and all the things that the left usually goes for. So uh, certainly it will do more uh, than than uh, the proposed gun, increasing gun control for the media to, to show a little voluntary restraint in reporting on these stories. There are academic studies that show that as, as well, that media yes. is really contributing. I mean, and some outlets still do it, right? I mean, like there are still some like TV stations or websites that are just like blasting these loser murderous you know reprobates photos like like all over and it, it is it's so beyond irresponsible i mean like i feel like just like asking those editors those producers whatever like what are you doing i mean like what value add to your programming do you get or putting a photo or a name or really kind of any biographical detail any pertinent information whatsoever i i think the problem is obviously much deeper than that. I mean, you know, as people have been saying for, you know, for decades now, I mean, look, this is this problem infamously does not have like, like an easy panacea. There is no quick, easy, dirty solution there. I have long been sympathetic to the, you know, we're, we're like raising generations, millennials, Gen Z, on kind of first person shooter video games. I mean, I cannot help but think that the proliferation of, of mass access gaming like this um, you know, I, I can't help but think that that probably hurts. I mean, it, it probably it has some marginal contribution. I remember when I was growing up, honestly, when I was a kid, I had to convince my my mom to let me get my first first person shooter video game, which was uh, GoldenEye 007 for Nintendo 64, if any of the listeners or viewers remember that excellent and thoroughly enjoyable video game. But I can't help but think that that is contributing here as well. One other thought that I have always had here is, uh, you know, part of the... It, it could be part of the problem or it could be part of the solution, depending on, depending on how you view it. America's execution capital punishment system infamously, infamously takes forever because of our of our appeals and just the various ways that, that judges have, have, in, have um, enacted kind of habeas corpus case law over and over again to kind of give criminals increasingly more like rights of appeal. Uh, the book that I um, helped Ted Cruz write in 2020, one vote away. We kind of devote a, a large chapter de dedicated to kind of just the the broken nature of America's kind of capital punishment system. So on the one hand, I I, I think the like quick executions per uh, if I if I'm going to sound like a, like a little edgy, and my really personally preferred policy would be quick public executions where the state is making very clear it is taking a life and why it's taking a life. But, you know, in the back of my head, I have like the flip side of me saying like, you know, would this actually like incentivize these sickos because of like the whole sensationalized thing. So I don't know. I, it's just an infamously difficult problem. Um, and there's really just no easy cause. But I think it, at a bare minimum, it is incumbent upon us to not let ourselves be numbed by the horrifically increasing frequency with which these tragedies are unfolding before our very eyes. Yeah, I mean, I I would echo everyone else's thoughts on this. One thing that strikes me is all of the knock on disastrous societal consequences of shutting down all life and then imposing these draconian decrees on people arbitrarily, arbitrarily and capriciously. We knew at the time, I mean, going back to March 2020, we knew at the time and there were some, although many of them were censored or attacked for it, some pointed out there would be all of these knock-on consequences and children would bear the ultimate brunt of them, even though they were the least likely to be physically impacted by the pandemic. So this was predictable and a conscious choice was made to essentially sacrifice future generations for present ones. 
And we've never grappled with that paradigm that was imposed. And really, even though obviously there's been a backlash to some extent against the draconian lockdowns and the like, so few of the most powerful people who were responsible for promulgating and executing those policies have really paid any price for it whatsoever. Somewhat analogous to you know, those in the security state who have never paid a price for all manner of lawlessness and corruption that they have propagated, produced uh, in recent years. So that just, just, I just point out, it's just sickening that we knew that this was going to happen. And, and America as a society didn't have the, we didn't have will as a people to say no to our leaders and combat what they were going to impose upon us, which was, which children were going to bear the brunt of the most, you know, obviously there are infinite factors that we could look to, you know, Josh mentioned the video games, breakdown of family, drug availability and potency, something I think most people don't want to touch, but certainly has to have a role in this. Uh, obviously, technology enables, um, to some extent, you know, some of the behaviors and conditions people, I think, towards some of these acts. Of course, you have the godlessness aspect in society, which we should not neglect in this conversation. Uh, and then, of course, the backlash against policing. I don't know how much, though, the policing and to Josh's point, you know, public executions, how much that would deter such acts or if we just have more brainwashed people with fewer guardrails in place than ever before. And at numerous points, of course, mind you, there's been a drop in disciplinary action taken against these individuals. So add all of these things up and it, that's how you get a massive shift in what had been a decades long decline in violent crime increasing across the board. And of course, the media is awful, cynical, and arguably a contributor to it, as has been discussed here. All right, so let's transition uh, to Inez, who will take us home by talking about how millennials are not getting more conservative with age. So over to you, Inez. Right. Famously, uh, <laughs> one of those famous aphorism, aphorisms that no one is actually sure uh, who came up with it. But if, if you are not a liberal at 25, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative at 35 or 40, you have no brain. Right. Um, th there is this well-established pattern. There's a reason that that aphorism um, has been repeated in so many different societies. Uh, so there is this well sort of established pattern that people, as they get older, as often they invest themselves in the society, whether that's by buying property, having children, you know, um, they have more to conserve. Uh, they they become more conservative and they start voting uh, more with the conservative parties in their country. Um, well, at least in the United States and in the United, in the United Kingdom as well, uh, millennials are not following that pattern. Um, in fact, millennials, uh, if, if following the previous patterns of previous generations, they should be only about five points uh, more liberal than the national average. Instead, they're 15 points. And in fact, the, the trend is going in the opposite direction. In other words, the, the gap between the average voter and the average millennial voter is widening, not shrinking. Um, and this is all coming from a, a, a set of surveys uh, that are reported in the Financial Times um, in, in the UK and, and in the US. Uh, if there's any sort of hope, um, for, for the right here, uh, it's that Gen X is actually turning conservative considerably before uh, their, their um, boomer and silent generation counterparts. So Gen X is actually on track to become more conservative than boomers, like even they're going to overlap and vote more Republican than boomers do uh, soon. But th that's not that's going to be scant help because Gen X is a very small generation in America. Uh, millennials are the largest generation in American history. And Gen Z is probably going to follow. They're not in this survey, but Gen Z is probably going to more follow the millennial trajectory. So with that said, um, I think the reasons for this are fairly obvious. The, the reason is that indoctrination works. Um, we, we really have had, uh, for the first time, millennials were um, the first to be taught by the post-1968 generation of teachers, whether that's in universities or, and increasingly all the way down into K-12. I know my education, um, granted, was in the Bay Area, but was already extremely uh, left-wing, anti-American. Um, a lot of the, the sort of uh, things that... Um, a lot of things that uh, uh, I learned when I was in high school about, for example, American history and the whole frame on on um, the American way of life was very much uh, what we're debating now in, in the public square. So um, 
for, for whatever reason, this also means that whether for ideological or for structural economic reasons, um, our generation has not invested itself in society in the same way, whether that's for proper, through property or posterity, right? Um, so there are all kinds of reasons for this, but this is something, regardless of the reasons, that the right really has to grapple with. And it means that there's a very short window for some kind of structural success because uh, millennials soon are going to take over nearly every position. Um, there's likely, and, and this is what we really need to avoid as, as the right, we need to avoid the boomer to millennial handoff. Uh, we really need to give Gen X at least you know, five or 10 years uh, to set some of the ships right before this, this massive generation takes over. Um, and furthermore, I, it's, it's, it's one of those things that um, Emily and I frequently talk about but I, I really do think there is a, a imagine as a sand sort of um, time clock with the sand dripping out because um, every generation, every single year, our institutions are going to become more woke and not less woke. There's this sort of, um, I think, uh, a, a bit of wishful thinking or, or sort of um, cope that's going on on the right when they see a lot of what are essentially high profile Gen X defectors. I would put Barry Weiss. Um, in this category, I, I would put uh, even someone like Elon Musk in this category, right? You're going to see high profile Gen X defectors, but when the next generation takes the reins, there is going to be a massive values shift and we better prepare structurally. In my view, that means, you know, stopping it, the pipeline on the other end by, by crushing the universities um, in, in a variety of ways, taking control, back control over K-12 education. So we have to stop the pipeline on the other end. Uh, but even if we did that tomorrow, understand that this generation and a half is going to be like, uh, the metaphor I always use is like a snake um, digesting like a, a, a water buffalo or whatever it is, right? This, this, um, this society, our country is going to have to digest a generation and a half, a uh, very large generation and a half of people who have fundamentally radically different values uh, than the generations that came before them. And that's not going to change with age. That's if, if anybody still believes that, um, they really are huffing the copium. So with that, I'll, I'll toss it back out to the rest of you. So there's a lot, I mean, to think about in, in all of that, because the Gen X um, wrench really, like it, it really throws off the, if, if someone wants to make, you know, sort of a uh, chart that's showing like the directions switching and then looks at Gen X and is, is sort of puzzled and wonders, um, will millennials go in that direction at all? I mean, I don't know. It's always funny to me to think back. Um, it, there's a lot of I talk about you know, so-called zombie Reaganism, especially in new right circles. And uh, there are some people who absolutely are, you know, overly defensive of the free market fundamentalist corporate policies that may have had a place in the kind of financial ecosystem at one time, um, but are, are probably not right for the country at this point. They're, that exists, and I wouldn't deny that. But Reaganism won the youth vote twice and uh, by healthy margins. Um, and so I think there's, it was a, it was a different time, obviously. It's not saying, you know, just repeat that playbook. Um, but when this was in 2015, I think, when you juxtaposed Marco Rubio with Hillary Clinton um, in a poll, I want to say it was a Washington Post poll in 2015, uh, Marco Rubio actually did better with young voters than Hillary Clinton did. Um, so the it's not all good news for Democrats either, but that count that that demands more for like for them to actually suffer the consequences um that demands the right to come up with with answers to these questions and with better ways to talk about things and message things um and you know that's i i don't see much of that happening frankly but it's also just that if you look at and as and i were talking about this last night actually if you look at what joe rogan covers on his show it's a lot of stuff that really weren't was not in the political arena period um and still really isn't, but because people like Rogan and Huberman um, and, and maybe like Friedman and other people who are tangentially political um, or on the periphery of American politics have picked up on them, you're starting to hear more talk about them. Uh, and that's like obesity, obviously, is a huge one. Health is a huge one. Um, all of these, these different things that we haven't previously, tech is really, really big. So I think there's room for the right to, to regain the trust of some 
millennials and some Zoomers um, that may not otherwise be favorable to them because I think they're watching their world kind of crash in, a, in very unexpected ways, the ways that boomers and millennials and extras didn't expect. And uh, that means they're going to be looking for solutions to those problems. So it, it's hard to sort of kind of chart the path forward, but I think there will be some twists and turns that we, we don't even foresee right now. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure that I have like a quick and neat, tidy thesis as to kind of how to turn the ship around. I, I certainly agree with Inez that the, you know, the so-called like everyone gets older or get, everyone gets more conservative as they get older line that has been invariably trotted out since as long as I started following politics, you know, has always been kind of a, a bit of copium uh, or uh, hopium, whatever, whatever kind of the, the millennial term is. But you know, I, I, you know, I, I struggle with like how to turn this around. I mean, I guess one thing that comes immediately to mind you know, Patrick Dunin and some of um, you know uh, are the post-liberal types uh, like to refer to kind of founders-ism as, as kind of um, this general kind of uh, uh, disease, I guess, is or malady is is maybe how they would phrase it. With how some on the right just talk over and over and over again about the founding and making and making the founding great again and the founding fathers. It's kind of like this like Reagan era talk. I mean, it's it's kind of like boomer, boomer con stuff to an extent, right? We hear it on many syndicated radio shows on conservative talk radio. And, you know, I, I, if I'm like a Gen Z or a Zoomer person, I'm growing up in a world where we see the threats that we see out there with the woke ideology and the education, the indoctrination. You know, if, I, if I'm like a late teens, early 20s kind of person, I mean, I have to think, you know, that kind of this overly philosophical talk about like uh, originalism and like uh, all this stuff is probably just totally out to lunch. So at a bare minimum, it would be nice to see those on the right focusing disproportionately more on hard hitting, deeply impactful, deeply impactful, practical policies, and a little less in the philosophical weeds. That's probably probably the best that I can do, honestly, as far as kind of uh, getting a prescription here. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a prescription either. I just throw out a few uh, kind of random and not necessarily linked observations or thoughts on this. And one of them being, I wonder, are millennials going to be more conservative or as conservative as prior generations were just at a 10 year lag? Uh, so in other words, as people live in suspended adolescence longer than ever before, as we see in this society, will they ultimately become more conservative, quote unquote, because the facts of life are more conservative when they're actually living real life, as opposed to, uh, you know, kind of what we have now, which is this suspended adolescence that going on later and later, people getting married later and later, having kids later and later, building their careers later, et cetera. The other thing is, is it this in part because millennials view it as in their own self-interest, rightly or wrongly, to be on the side of the good, the just, the virtuous, the social justice warriors, because it helps them in their careers, because there's immense social pressure to do so, because their social media feeds impact their views. So I can imagine that there are more pressures and stressors for someone today than there might have been in past generations, uh, leading them to take on the kind of herd, progressive, woke, globalist kind of mentality. The only other question I'd ask is when the progressive policies ultimately come to fruition and hurt their jobs, hurt their kids, wreck their morale, where do they turn at that point? So at minimum, we better have an answer for that. All right. So let's transition to final thoughts here. Uh, I, I can kick us off because I actually do have a final thought for this week. So one topic that I don't think people on the right are talking about um, enough is the fact that the Elon Musk takeover of Twitter, which for a while looks like it was going really well, it's now very unclear <laughs> that it's actually going well. So I have a, a friend who I will, uh, you know, I will leave him nameless here, but you know, he has been in, um, you know, in active communication with, uh, with uh, what I'm told are some high ranking uh, Twitter programmers and coders. And apparently the shadow bands are totally back. And part of the reason that the shadow bands are back which anecdotally kind of um, corroborates kind of my own observations, uh, which I've heard from so many friends about how engagement is just way, way down. No one is seeing each other's tweets. No one's getting any traction, like uh, views and all that have just totally gone down there. Apparently part of the problem is that the previous regime, their algorithms and codes were just so epically messed up 
that uh, Elon's new people trying to tweak it when they try to like make something better, like uh, it makes something else worse. I, I I don't know what the hell I'm talking about when it gets into computer programming. So I probably maybe I sound stupid, but that is kind of roughly what what I had been told is that they're having a really 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 hard time, you know, whether it's incompetence or a, the previous system was just simply that bad to actually get Twitter going on the trajectory that I think many of us hope that it would that it would that it would continue to. And you know, I think at, at this point Twitter under Elon Musk has also, you know, laid off, I think I think I saw the number was 75%, if I'm not mistaken, of their employees, most of whom I'm sure deserve to go. I mean, most of most of them are probably just, you know, woke karate's um, you know, idiots. But you know, at some point you do need some human resources too. So I mean, you know, I would I would I would hope that at least some of those valuable positions, you know, have been refilled and you know I, I, the twitter files have been great and you know elon still gets a lot of credit obviously but i think it's important just to shine a spotlight right now and i'd be, I'd be, I'd be curious for your for your guys like um anecdotal experiences over the past month month and a half or so on twitter as well i mean i i just feel like engagement is like nothing and, and you know as another friend said to me it kind of it kind of feels like late stage myspace out there just just like no one's using it anymore and like it's it, it's not in like a it's not heading in a good place right now maybe by the way that's actually a good thing if twitter collapses and dies i'm not sure i'm not sure that would be the worst thing for society to be honest with you but you know i'm really shining a spotlight on the fact that Elon Musk's takeover, which many of us rightly, you know, celebrated the time, and he still has done a lot of good stuff. Uh, at this point, I think it is very unclear, you know, whether or not um, he is going to be able to see this thing through to fruition. So, um, oh, oh, go ahead, that, Anas. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I always kind of thought that Elon Musk, um, as the the sort of conservative billionaire champion, was way overrated. But I don't think Elon Musk, as the CEO, is overrated at least not yet uh, i'm having some of the same engagement issues but but i think we forget very quickly like previous twitter also had all those issues right um, all these annoying like software updates and all of a sudden the algorithm would change and it'd be different for a month and then they change it back like um so it, this is not the first time that these kinds of problems have have uh have hit twitter and i think the fact that he fired all his staff actually will be um, we re it remains to be seen, but we'll see pretty quickly because right now the tech sector is going into, uh, as predicted, uh, going into a major contraction where there's going to be a lot of layoffs. And I still think that the example of Twitter laying off 70% of its staff or 75% of its staff and continuing to basically function um, is going to, to be a pretty powerful um, example. But uh, my uh, my final thought, I wanted to point people to this um, this piece written called The Shape of Metal by Addison Del Maestro, uh, based on an article of all places uh, that he wrote for The Bulwark. So this might be the first time The Bulwark is positively cited on this show. Uh, but it, it's it's a really... Um, it's a really fascinating piece. I recommend people go read it, but it's based on uh, the, the demise of this, this little pastina, tiny star-shaped pasta, which is very popular apparently with Italians in like the New Jersey, New York area. Um, but that's not really what it's about. It's about the fact that manufacturing uh, capabilities um, come all together. And it's often very, very difficult to restart industries that, that have moved somewhere else. So essentially, in order to make even this tiny little star-shaped pasta, you need uh, the machines that make the dyes and the molds uh, that make the machines that then make the pasta. And so there really isn't that kind of capability. And, and um, one of the haunting things uh, that is, is in this article is somebody's response to his original Bulwark article was basically, we, we cannot make the world we live in anymore right so essentially things are running down and think about the machines that manufacture even in the united states the machines that are manufacturing a lot of the things that we take for granted even if we try to bring them home um, those machines are maybe 40 50 years old they're running through and we don't have the manufacturing capability to replace those machines so it all kind of ties together and it's very very difficult to restart once it's um once it's gone uh, either to southeast asia or somewhere else or just mothballed so um it's, it's a really haunting piece i think it, it really uh, highlights the challenge of returning any kind of making things uh, manufacturing uh, to the united states beyond some of the um beyond some of the, the the concerns about for example like trade and tariffs and all that there, there is a very practical uh, and difficulty in, in restarting manufacturing once it's once it's gone away so i recommend that piece 
I was just going to say, uh, actually, I was going to reference a lot of the points Inez makes often uh, in this broad argument about what is left of our institutions, even if you have, I mean, think, think of with Twitter, even if you have an Elon Musk jump in, um, put a crazy amount of money, uh, totally overvaluing the product itself, and then come in and try to uh, shape everything up. Well, the problem is that you're going to have a hard time staffing uh, with the, the personnel necessary um, to, to really turn the Titanic around. It takes a lot of people and it takes a lot of people who are sort of mission driven on that point, which is the point should be that there's no real mission. <laughs> like that there should be the, the mission should be to run the product and, and not to run it as, you know, an activist arm of the democratic party or anything like that. Um, so I, that, that is the thing that really, if there's something that keeps me up at night, it's that you, you can have, let's say the, the Xers, you have Gen Xers like Elon Musk, and Barry uh, Weiss want to turn the Titanic around in media and in tech, um, but they they aren't able to find people um, to do the that the work enough people to do the work. I'm not saying that's a permanent state of affairs, um, but for now that does seem to be a snag that a lot of people are hitting. And I'll say also it reminds me. Funny enough, of the viral uh, controversy over the stupid new Velma series, so stupid, that is so profoundly unfunny. People on the left are speculating it's a psyop uh, by conservatives. Like, it's so bad. Conservatives intentionally made this Velma show so bad to make the le left look ridiculous. The reality, actually, is that Hollywood has totally pushed talented people out of the space, disincentivized talented people working in writer's rooms to the point where they're no longer capable of producing really funny stuff in every case because the incentives just aren't there and the talent's just not there. It's been totally, uh, the, the priorities have been totally mixed away from creating a, a quality product into creating essentially an activist product in so many different cases. Um, and that's really ruined Hollywood. So it, it's just their example, there's example after example. And Mindy Kaling, I think is a, a Gen Xer, someone who used to be really funny and who has a decent handle on, on comedy, who has I think gotten increasingly less funny. Um, and you know you can you can try to make a funny product, but good luck uh, staffing that staffing that uh, endeavor uh, because it's just increasingly dwindling supply of uh, people who are able to just do the work uh, without doing it as activism. Um, well, first, in answer to Josh's question, yeah, engagement definitely down. I, I don't see people in my timeline that I used to see all the time, and uh, so I feel like I'm missing a lot to the extent I'm actually wasting time in Twitter. Um, so yeah, there are some bugs to be fixed, to put it mildly. Um, I do think you know, it is interesting. There are these mass layoffs happening in a lot of industries uh, and in tech in particular. And I'm curious to see when the dust settles in what areas within corporations these cuts are happening. Are the corporations essentially cutting their own administrative states that is, those who are not profit generators, but cost centers, in effect, within companies in administrative roles, in DEI-related roles, sustainability-related roles, ESG writ large, and the like? Or is it across the board and indiscriminate? It'll be interesting to see. A theory that I continue to hold to is that, for example, with universities, to the extent there's a massive economic shock to our system, I suspect the administrators would be the first people to go in a circumstance like that. And so it will be interesting to see if uh, ultimately the capitalism or something appro approximating it that's been hijacked by the locusts uh, ends up being their demise to some extent. Uh, I guess that's a relatively optimistic, but also um, you know, kind of sad and demoralizing scenario as well. Um, separately, one thing that I just wanted to go back to broadly, you know, there was a comment earlier about how uh, you know, wh whether it's in the usurpation of power from the people in the judiciary or in the executive branch or elsewhere, that people think those in power believe that they know better. And I think that's definitely a part of it. I also think they believe that they have a moral authority because they have done well in some sort of metric to believe that not only they know better, but but they should impose what they know to be better on everyone else. And you know, they're willing to use now tactics that we haven't really seen before, I don't think, like the 
leaking of a Supreme Court opinion or a whole slew of other ways in which people take power into their hands to subvert anyone who dares get in their way. Now, maybe it's always been the case that you've had analogous acts to this. You know, I believe that there's nothing new under the sun. But something that I do come back to pondering a lot is, you know, are people fundamentally different today to, to a degree than they've been in the past? Or is this just the necessary kind of cycle that civilizations go through of reaching the apex of greatness and then frittering away and and essentially repudiating all the principles that made them great in the first place. It's hard to know. People are mixtures of good and evil, obviously, in different proportions. There are always people who want to uh, usurp power, seize it, and use it to enrich and empower themselves. Uh, I, I wonder if we've had a scenario before where people are willing to actually see their children hurt in service of their ideology. I mean, I'm sure there have been, of course, other civilizations that have been willing to wreck themselves knowingly because they think they're pursuing some higher good. But it leads me to to kind of questions, broader questions that we won't answer, you know, and kind of existential questions of what what would cause a change in the operations in the worldview of the Davoisie? I'm not sure that there's anything that could do it, but what would cause a change? Could anything cause a change? And is this elite fundamentally different from elites that we've seen before? Or again, is this just kind of the natural cycle of civilizations? Uh, Questions we won't answer, but I put them out there and maybe we'll explore them in future episodes. Well, I'm sure we will explore them in future episodes and I look forward to doing so. But for now, on behalf of Inez, Emily, and Ben, I'm Josh Hammer. We will see you at the next NatCon Squad.